G'day ladies and gents, Cubic Meter here. Breaking a fortified position can be pretty risky, especially if you're lacking the manpower to overwhelm a position. One way to gain advantage in any conflict is through the use of force multipliers. For example, in Minecraft we have the humble old TNT cannon. However, one issue is that these cannons are extremely limited in their range and accuracy. Case in point, that cannon just went straight through the middle of that tower like it wasn't there. And needless to say, having to adjust this cannon on the fly doesn't make for a very good force multiplier as your enemy can see you and respond. But what if there was a TNT cannon that could be aimed and fired at specific targets in an enemy fortification? And that is exactly what I have for you right here. Let me introduce you to Minecraft's Smart Artillery. Let's teach those pillagers a lesson. We've got the origin of the cannon set. Let's go ahead and eye in our target. There we go, we've now got the settings for our cannon. So what we want is 5 TNT on the propellant side. Here is our payload. We go around the back. We can now set up the timers. So we want 32, 35, and 64. The cannon is now loaded and ready to fire. Let's hit the trigger and get in position to see it in action. Oh yeah. Now for the kill shot. Let's do the same settings, however, I want to go ahead and increase this timer just a little bit. This will give our payload a little bit more fuse time, allowing us to get that money shot right in the middle of that mob of pillagers. Let's hit the trigger again. And kablooey! That is a demoralized position. Let's go ahead and hit them one more time for good luck. I think by now anybody in their right mind would be running scared. In fact, would you look at that? They're already fleeing from the position. With the fortification broken, this now gives us ample opportunity to move in and pick them off one by one. I think it was Sun Tzu who once said that in the art of war, use a gun, and if that don't work, use more gun. Well, I think that raining TNT from the high heavens on a fortified position is enough to soil the pants of any defender. Just look at the damage we did to this thing. This artillery isn't just limited to hitting towers out in the middle of nowhere, no siree. Using Lightmatica, we can visualize the entire field of fire of this artillery as a schematic. So this shape shows every position that we could theoretically create an explosion by simply setting this cannon. Later on, we'll get into the sophisticated theory about how this cannon was derived in the first place. But for now, let's go ahead and slowly dismantle this amazing medieval village designed by the one and only Spey. Be sure to check out his channel where he did a full build time lapse of this village in survival. Huh, I guess we can call that a demolition time lapse. 
Alright, enough terrorizing small medieval villages. How does the smart artillery actually work? If you've been paying attention, you may have noticed me using a special command known as UCSM. This command sets the origin for the cannon. And this lets me set the target by simply looking at a block and running the command. And this will print out the settings for our cannon as well as the distance to the closest point that our cannon can hit to the target that we selected. A huge thanks to Kiku G, who actually made the program that you can load into Minecraft as a client mod to make using this cannon a lot more easier. What you have is these three numbers separated by commas which indicate the fill level of these barrels from left to right. The fourth number at the end, the number 4 in this case, is actually the amount of TNT we want to place in the back of the cannon which propels our payload forwards. Our payload then sits in this cell right here. And what you'll notice is that the instant that I start priming this first timer right here, so if I put a single item in, it will prime the cannon and dispense some water right here. And what we get is effectively one, two, three, four degrees of freedom in order to aim our TNT cannon. The first degree is how far the propellant TNT moves along this water stream right here. When this first timer reaches zero, what will happen is the water will go away. And when we remove the water, the TNT will stop moving. And that means that using that first timer, we can control where the propellant TNT stops in this axis. The second timer will control when we prime our payload. So when this middle timer reaches zero, we prime and then align our payload. However, what you'll notice is that when we initially prime the payload, it sits still and won't start moving until we push it into the flowing water. So the final timer is when we actually move the payload into the flowing water and then it will start moving sideways like this. This means we can precisely control where the payload is when our propellant detonates. Adding all of this together and what we obtain is an extremely fine control over the alignment of the TNT and thus we can very accurately tune where the TNT detonates. The only problem is that it's not very intuitive what settings you need for these three timers in order to hit a specific coordinate. And this problem is actually very complicated to solve because you need to somehow correlate the settings for these timers to the TNT flying to a very specific coordinate. So starting at the position you want to hit, you need to take into account the trajectory of the TNT, which will follow a ballistic arc from the cannon all the way to where the TNT originates. And then that arc would be dependent on the specific alignment of the payload and the propellant. And then that alignment is extremely dependent on the time that we take to do each alignment step. So if we want to know the exact settings that we need to hit a specific coordinate, we're going to need to simulate the entire process of aligning the TNT and then the entire process of the TNT flying through the air and exploding. Needless to say, this is going to need a lot of maps. My method would begin with a prototype of the cannon. So all I'll do is place down some TNT in the setup and then I would use a repeating command block to constantly print out the coordinates of the TNT every single tick. So now if I go ahead and flip this lever, I will get a perfect record of this TNT's motion over time. Here is all of the data printed out in my single player console. 
that I can literally copy and paste this into a program that can then use this data to produce our simulation. My program of choice for doing these computations is MATLAB because MATLAB is extremely good at handling any mathematical problem that can be represented in the form of a matrix. Loading our data into MATLAB, we can produce this nice plot of the position of the TNT over time. So what this represents is the exact position of our TNT at each game tick that it was printed out by that command block. So we start up here at this position. The TNT enters the water and then starts accelerating. And then it eventually reaches a constant velocity, which is this straight section right here, until it reaches the very end of the water stream, where it's no longer being pushed by the water and starts to decelerate due to friction. And then it eventually reaches its final position at the end right here. A sneaky trap to look out for is that you can't just pick a point on this line and say that if I set the timer to 38 that the TNT will stop at this exact position right here because as you can see when the water stops pushing the TNT it continues moving for a little bit until it stops and this makes sense right when we remove the water the TNT continues to move just a little bit until it is slowed completely by friction. Here we have a plot of the velocity of the TNT over time. This thick black line is the velocity from the TNT that we tested and measured. And then all these colored lines are the extrapolated velocity if the TNT were to stop moving at that exact point. If we go ahead and examine one of these points, like so, we can say that two ticks after the TNT starts moving in the water, this is what its velocity is. We then want to track that TNT all the way down to zero velocity, assuming that we remove the water at this exact moment, meaning our final position will be the area underneath this curve. If you're not sure what I'm talking about, this is simply calculus, where velocity is the derivative of position, and so if you want to find position from velocity, you have to take the integral, and it just so happens that in our situation, the integral is the area under the curve from this point all the way to when the TNT stops moving. By taking into account the fact that the TNT slides a little bit after we remove the water, we obtain this new blue line which gives us the final position of the TNT if we remove the water at that exact point. And what you can see is that it is consistently slightly further than the position if the TNT were constantly moving. With a perfect model for the positions of each TNT in our cannon for each tick, we can now work towards computing every possible trajectory. For this, we can use a handy resource put together by the experts at the TNT archives to obtain a formula for our initial velocity vector. Our constants for this formula will be the power of the TNT explosion, which is 4, and the exposure, which we'll assume to be 1 for our cannon. Then we get to our degrees of freedom. These will be variables in our formula that we can tweak to get different trajectories out of our cannon. Firstly, we can control the amount of TNT. Then we can control the position of the propellant using the first timer, and the position of the payload with the third timer. We define the vector df as an arrow pointing from the propellant to the payload. We add exactly 0.06125 to the y coordinate to account for the fact that the heart of the TNT explosion is slightly above the feet of the TNT. DE is then simply a unit vector, meaning it points in the direction of DF but only has a length of 1. DE defines the direction of our initial velocity V. When we combine the two degrees of freedom in the vector DF with the amount of TNT, we obtain the initial velocity vector V. But hang on. What does this middle timer in between do? Well, this is the final degree of freedom at our disposal. The time of flight for our TNT. The way this works is that the closer T is to our third timer, the less time the TNT will have on its trajectory before it detonates. We also make sure to add a correction term T0 to account for delays in the redstone and fine tune the time of flight. 
This allows us to force an explosion to occur at a targeted position rather than allowing the TNT to continue its path and potentially miss a target. At the start of the video, you might remember me tweaking this value to allow the TNT to land inside of the pillager outpost to deal maximum damage. Once we simulate every single trajectory that the TNT can take, we can finally obtain a list of coordinates that the TNT will explode at which has a one-to-one -one correspondence with another list containing the settings of our cannon. That means that if I want to hit this coordinate right here relative to our cannon, I'll need to use this setting for the cannon. If we take all of the coordinates in this list and put it into a 3D space, we can create a three-dimensional object displaying every single point that we can hit using our cannon. This is what I like to call the point cloud. This is every single position that a TNT could explode at using our TNT cannon. This little green circle down here, that is where we set the origin of our cannon. And you can clearly see the pattern that we get from the TNT's trajectories going in all different directions. This is the same shape that I demonstrated earlier using Light Matica, where I simply took the entire point cloud and then turned it into a schematic that I could load in the game in order to actually visualize the entire space that the cannon can hit. And all of this just so that I can know the exact setting needed to hit a particular coordinate. And the most insane thing is that anybody game enough to follow my methodology could create their own cannon design and through experimentation derive their own point cloud for their own cannon design because once you have the list of coordinates and the list of settings to hit those coordinates all you need to do is go into your config folder to a file named UCSM which was created by the mod that Kikiju wrote for me and in here, you can put the lists, and these will be the point cloud and the cannon settings for your particular cannon design. This opens up an entire realm of possibility for cannon designs with different performance criteria that could offer different fields of fire to this cannon that I've designed here. Something that you will notice about the point cloud for my cannon design is that it's very asymmetrical. You have a lot more firing options in this direction than you have in this direction. In fact, if we come around here, you can see there are a lot of points here underneath which aren't covered by the field of fire. On the other hand, on this side, there are a lot of ways that you can get indirect fire for TNT to go up, over, and into something like this village. The reasoning for this has to do with the fact that trajectories that travel in this direction require the TNT to be primed later, meaning it has more time to fly through the air before it explodes. If you want to align the TNT over this side on the other hand, you have to prime the TNT and wait for it to move all the way over here where it's wasted a whole bunch of fuse time, which means that our TNT tends to detonate before it can actually hit the ground. So the further you go out, the higher the TNT detonates at. It should be possible to make better and improved designs which don't have these limitations. I'll be including the code that I use to generate the point cloud down in the description. In these scripts, you'll find various optimizations that make use of MATLAB's ability to solve problems in matrices very efficiently. For example, Instead of computing every single trajectory one at a time, I made one gigantic matrix where the rows would compose every combination of the cannon settings together. Then I could simply pass the columns of this matrix into the formulas that we derived before to derive the point cloud. I also did other optimizations for the cannon, such as choosing trajectories that tend to go up and over things rather than straight to the target. This makes the cannon better at firing over obstacles such as hills and walls. So there we have it! Minecraft smart artillery that can accurately hit targets within a wide field of fire. Ever since I conceived of the possibility of such a machine, I have been working extremely hard to make it a reality. 
And if you reckon that effort was worth your while, be sure to subscribe and let me know what you think of the smart artillery. Thank you all very much for watching and I will see you next time.